So, are you ready for our guest? Uh, yeah. Of course, as we announced, this is our very first writer symposium, as we call it. We are invited a special author to the program to answer your questions on writing. Yes. Hello. Hi, Dave. This has just been a crazy morning. <laughs> well, I, I bet it was. You're you're writing your book, and your your son got his his call the other day. So you're you're probably pretty excited and pretty busy. Yep, yep. So uh, the reason why we invited you back to the show is because our listeners keep on sending us questions. Mm -hmm. Sending us questions on writing and how, how to do different things. And usually we send them to your, you know, the kick in the pants because mm -hmm. you answer a lot of people's questions that way. Yeah. But they kept on sending us so many questions that I couldn't always find the answers to them in your blog right away. Right. And so we decided to invite you back on to talk about writing because sure. that's what we like to do. We like to talk about writing. But first and foremost, okay. welcome back. Well, thank you. So, um, we actually collected quite a few questions. Some of them are very specific for you, and some of them are, are, are general about writing. Sure. So, um, I guess the first thing we're going to ask is, uh, this comes from one of our listeners, it says, uh, when it comes to creating atmospheres, how do you know when to go into depth and when to not overdo it? Oh, you know, that's really, um, um, that's really actually a good question. The the thing that you have to look at is, you know, in creating the atmosphere for your story, which I, I think of typically as, you know, setting details and stuff like that. You're trying, first of all, to um, to make sure that you capture the uh, the emotional mood of your protagonist, you know. And so you give us the details that would create that mood. Um, so that's that's really one important task. But another thing that you have to do with any story is that you have to... Um, you have to transport your reader into the story, into the setting. And that's one of the very first things that you have to do in just about any story um, is, is take them away from their world and give them enough details so that they start inhabiting the world of your story, you know, on a middle basis and, and fully, you know, just carry them out of their seat. And so, you know, I look at it and I say, okay, is this transporting them? Do I do I fully involve the senses? You know, taste, feel, touch, uh, scent, sight. You know, sound. All of those things. You have to try to bring in enough details so that uh, so that you really fully create the world. And then at that point, you know, it's really a matter of personal taste as to how much you want. You know, Robert Jordan gives us a lot of details and really carries a reader deep into his world. And by doing that, he attracts an awful lot of readers. There are a lot of people who just want to inhabit that world and, you know, take a little vacation from their own daily grind. And uh, and that's a huge draw for his writing. And so, you know, you as a storyteller have to say, okay, when is it time for me to shut up and t quit talking about that and get the story moving along? Um, or do I want to keep on doing it? And it, it's really just a matter of personal taste. So I guess there's there's one more question that was given to us on this subject. I'll read the entire question, though. Most of it will just be a follow-up to this. It says, how do you create a setting which feels like an entire world or galaxy um, without overdoing exposition? For example, like how do you start a, a novel in a brand new setting without making it seem like a lecture or a, a textbook to describe everything? Yeah. Okay. Well, first of all, there's a number of ways to do it. First of all, you set the scene itself which means that you just get us into that scene. And that scene may require you to, um, you know, spend a little bit of time talking about uh, uh, the sights, the smells, the sounds, and all of that. Sometimes when you get into a story, um, you want to create a sense of history. So if I were describing a scene, I might say, okay, um, in the ruins of the... Uh, uh, of the cemetery at uh, at Scolar, for example, um, and you might talk about the cemetery, you know, in its heyday to sort of create a sense that this is a real place that has a past. Um, but that's really typically all that I do is is give enough details to create a sense of history and to get you grounded as to where you're at now. And uh, and once I've done that, I feel like I've done my job. 
I, that answered my question fully because when, when I when I see it, as you mentioned before, it depends on atmosphere, it depends on the character. So if it's supposed to be a darker, um, more mysterious character, you give less details than what you need. And if it's supposed to be a, you know, if it's supposed to be a jury mood or a jury character, you can get more details to help set the mood. Mm -hmm. um, and when it comes to creating a world, you. I kind of interpret your answer as you give as much as you need to to tell the story that you need, but don't give everything away at the beginning because they don't need it right away. Exactly. They don't need it right away. They only need as much as they need to set this, the particular scene, a particular character. Kind of exactly. like a whole, yeah, kind of like sort of like eating too much appetizer and not having enough room for your main meal. That's right. You're gonna you're gonna choke to death on all the details if you uh, if you give them too much. Yeah, true, and, true. And you can sit down and and seriously, you know, as you said, you can you can create a an encyclopedia of a world without ever telling a story, you know, <laughs> I mean, uh, yeah. and you know, you give, give detail to every single city and all the backgrounds of the people that live in them. And, you know, and it, it can just get ridiculous. So you have to, you have to just skim the surface. Mm. Well, moving on to another question along that vein, uh, we get another one here, which is, how do you approach the backgrounds of the minor characters? Do you prefer to write out a full backstory or just keep them fairly hollow? I like to keep them fairly hollow. Um, you know, the, the problem is one of focus and, and you have to decide who your minor characters are going to be and who your major characters are going to be. And one of the things that signals that a character is a major character is when we start to, you know, giving us a lot of, or giving the reader a lot of background details about the character. If you give a character name, uh, you know, that in itself attracts a lot of attention. Instead of saying the doorman, you know, if I say uh, Jonathan Gould, you know, um, all of a sudden I've attached more importance to that character. If I give that character power, um, that also tells the reader that, hey, this person's important. You know, the doorman um, slipped the Derringer into his pocket. Okay, now you've got a doorman with a gun in his pocket and you know that he might be, you know, uh, play a major role in this story. Um, if you put that character in pain, then once again, you're signifying to the reader that this is the character is important. So if I say Jonathan Gould, you know, um, wept as he, uh, you know, walked into the street. Okay, we don't know why he's weeping. Obviously, he's some he's emotionally disturbed about something. He's sticking a gun in his pocket and going into the street. Um, and so each time you do something like that, you attach more importance to that character and turn them into a major character. And if this were at the very beginning of the story, you might read about Jonathan Gould and say, okay, this guy is really important. You know, this is the protagonist to my story. Um, and, and all of those things signal that he's a protagonist. Um, but the truth is that uh, he could just be the doorman, you know, and he's got very little or nothing to do with the story that you want to tell. And so you keep all of those details, just, you know, just keep him a doorman, no gun in his pocket, no stalking the streets with tears in his eyes. Um, he's just watching the door while your protagonist walks through. You know, that's that's what you have to do. You, you make sure that you signal that uh, that you're dealing with the important characters and you leave the minor ones fairly much in the background. Now, you can do things to create him as a real character. We could give Jonathan Gould a, uh, a nice English accent, you know, and, uh, and so he approaches, a, uh, uh, he approaches a cab and says, you know, mate, you left your purse behind, you know, and uh, something like that and and that establishes a little bit more of a character or we can give him you know some sort of quirky uh, dress that signals that uh, this is the doorman you know he's wearing his red uh, pee vest the, that signals that he's the doorman at, uh, at the uh, New York Arms Hotel um, but we we don't really want to get into giving them names. We don't want to give them deep backgrounds. We don't want to talk about their home life and, you know, their secondary conflicts, you know, the troubles he's having with his wife and his monetary problems and how much he hopes for a tip and all of that kind of stuff. You know, that can just kind of keep in the background. Um, so anything that you do that, uh, that places emphasis on your secondary characters 
you know, that takes away emphasis from your main characters. You know, you've got a certain number of pages, maybe 400 pages of writing that you can do on your, uh, you know, that you can that you can allow towards dealing with the conflicts of your major characters. And so you don't want to diminish the power of that by focusing on minor characters and, and what may, you know, turn out to be minor problems, you know, for those characters. Mm. Excellent. Um, so I guess a follow-up to that one would be, uh, which character personality traits are usually overused and how do you avoid overusing those traits? No, oh, the first one is, um, First of all, let's get into physical traits. Um, whenever I see a character, uh, one of the things I always, uh, I had somebody uh, was talking about one of their characters in a fantasy novel uh, in one of my classes a couple of weeks ago. And, uh, and I said, oh, is her name uh, Kat? Uh, Katrina or uh, uh uh, Catherine, and she says, well, her name is Catrice, but she goes by Cat. And I said, oh, okay. And she said, how did you know? And I said, you know, everybody in fantasy seems to name their, their character, their female characters, with a K-A-T uh, sound. Um, I don't know why that is. It's just so common that it's, it's over the top. So you're talking about characteristics. First of all, look at your names. Um, are they things that you've seen way too much? Um, the second thing, people always talk about eyes and hair. It just drives me nuts. Um, very often in a young adult story, we'll start off, and on the first page, the person will reach up and, you know, sleek back, um, you know, a lock of her blonde hair or her red hair or her, you know, uh, la da da. Um, so there's this always this action of, of reaching up and touching your hair. The other one is eyes. Um, people are always looking at, she peered at his blue eyes with her green, okay? Um, I have read many stories where nothing about the character at all is said except the color of their eyes, you know? And so those are really overdone. Um, I get sick of reading stories where a single tear rolled down someone's cheek, okay? Um, we've been told a long time ago that uh, uh, when you're writing, you know, it's a single detail catches your attention. So a single tear running down your cheek is something that writing teachers, uh, you know, 30 years ago told us that you should do. Uh, the problem was, a couple of days ago, I was reading a story where the entire world had been destroyed, and this woman was escaping on a spaceship with, you know, half a dozen other passengers, um, and she looks down upon the world as it's, you know, uh, being blown into bits, and and a single cheer, uh, a tear rolls down her cheek, and I looked at it, and I thought, wow, that's all she could spare for the world? You know, all of her family, her her nieces, her nephews, her mother, her father, you know, and she gives them a single tear. I thought, wow, that's just way underdone. Um, I feel like, so really, I, don't you think she'd be sobbing her eyes out? Yeah, I, I, think, I think she would be a mess. Um, so, you know, there's, there's certain things like that that I see overdone. Face, hair color. Men uh, sometimes write too much about women's breasts. Uh, I had a story a, a couple of years ago where... It starts out describing three women walking down the street, and uh, and this young man looks over and sees them, and and one of the girls is particularly big chested, and for the next ten pages he goes over and he's holding a conversation with her, and she tells him her name, but uh, but he keeps referring to her as the girl with the breasts. Okay, um, yeah. it was just ludicrous. It was just ludicrous. I just wanted to. You know, hunt this guy down and slap him. Uh, but it was a it was a submission for a writing contest, so I never did find out who did it. Um, but you know, it was it was just laughable. Um, so anything that you find yourself um, referring to, you know, frequently, uh, beware. You know, a lot of times um, men in particular don't describe clothing on their characters. And so You'll read entire stories, entire novels by men where nobody has any clothes described, 
whereas a woman might take a take a page to describe a dress, you know. And if you're trying to capture readers of both sexes, um, I think it's important to make sure that you do um, describe dress, you know, and go so far as to use name brands. You know, he's wearing Levi's instead of blue jeans. Um, and uh, because so often giving the precise details about the dress just does a world to create that character in the minds of the, of the reader, you know, and so... Um, I look for things like that, and I, I think I think that just about every author has little blind spots, things that they mention a lot, the things they mention too much. And what I try to do is sit back and say, okay, in, my, in describing my character, have I described their dress? Have I described their jewelry? Have I described their history, their background? Have I given them, um, you know, have I given them a past? Have I given them internal dialogue, you know, thoughts? Uh, you know, all those things help bring the character to life. And you can't really ignore, you can't really ignore anything. Oh. So unless like, you know, eyes or hair or, you know, describing, you know, a, a female, you know, it has a major part to do with that scene or that story or that character at that moment, we should probably avoid it entirely unless it has something to actually move the story along. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, you know, when you when you say that he sees three people across the street, uh, their character sees three people across the street, if they're going to be important, you know, uh, later on in the story, um, there ought to be some minimal description, you know, uh, uh, big thuggy looking character with uh, with his two ratty looking friends. OK, that might be enough. Um, or you can get a little bit further into their dress or, you know, do they seem to pose any threat? You know, do they look like they were, you know, one of them's like wants to head toward him. The other two are like, no, you know, uh, you, you start looking at uh, what is it that he really thinks about when he sees them? You know, that's really what it comes down to. So um, it's kind of like a thing, like it's sort of like, all right, there's three characters on the street. If they're just going to be, you know, they're just there. It's like, you know, and as he's walking, he sees three people down the street and you just kind of leave it at that. But like, maybe you want one of them to be like, uh, maybe you plan on using one down the line. You could say like, you know, he sees uh, three women walking down the street. One in particular catches his gaze, you know, because she's yeah. wearing uh, an emerald hued uh, top or something like that. Yes, exactly. He, you know, okay. he's this cool uh, emerald coat uh, that, uh, he looks at or something and then you just use enough to tag him and then later on you know when he sees her close up he might be able to get into more description she's wearing an emerald coat and she's got uh, strawberry blonde hair and green eyes and you know uh, and we can get into more detail and then when she talks we should probably find out what her voice sounds like you know um, and you know, maybe in describing her voice, she might have an Irish accent, you know, or something. So, you know, we'll get deeper into what her voice sounds like and, and how she speaks, you know, how she talks, but then also speaking reveals who you are internally. You know, what does she say? You know, is she a jokester? Is she a serious person? Is she, uh, you know, desperate for help? And uh, we get into all those details, you know, pretty much as you need them, you know, I mean, that's that's kind of the, the rule of writing is you do it a little bit by the seat of your pants. So what about when it comes to um, personalities of characters? Because I imagine since you do a lot of uh, judging of, when it, of writing and so on, that you see a lot of books which are obviously you see the writer's personality in every single character. Like mm -hmm. they've just imprinted themselves on the page. Like how do we avoid just making an imprint of ourselves on every single character and making – to just make it so every character is actually unique as a different personality rather than just different aspects of ourselves every single time? Well, the easy way to do that is to take people that you know closely and, and model characters on them. And so very often, uh, you know, if I were creating a villain, for example, you know, I used to work in the prison, I might uh, say, oh, yeah, I knew this one guy. You know, this is the way he talked and this is the way he moved and this is the way he acted and... and uh, and I could sit down and say, okay, I'm going to use Jerry as my villain. Um, another way that people do it that works pretty well is to pick a movie star in a particular role and write that character. So you could say, okay, I'm going to take Jack Nicholson from The Shining 
and uh, and I'm going to put him in the story. Okay, now you know exactly what that character looks like. You know how he speaks, and uh, and you can probably do a pretty good job of creating that character based around you know some a few minimal details. Um, Am I anything like Jack Nicholson in The Shining? I don't think so. You know, <laughs> uh, he, he seems to be a real, uh, he seems to be a real uh, alive character with a distinct personality, you know, a little bit crazy and, and uh, mean and, uh, you know, although, uh, you know, he has this one thing where he sits down and he's writing this novel and he keeps uh, writing over and over again, all work and no play makes Jack a dull boy. Um, and uh, sometimes I feel like I've spent the entire day and accomplished nothing more than what Jack Nicholson did in that movie. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, exactly. You know, a lot of authors will just really go in and find a character from a favorite novel, favorite movie, and pull that character in and use that character and uh, you know, a, a basic character around that person. And that works pretty well, too. Okay, so I guess well, uh, this one would be just the last follow-up on this topic um, personally is, you know, when I write, I tend to say I want to go big or go home. And so I have a, te I have a tendency of going way over dramatic mm -hmm. or way over the top just because I'm like, well, something needs to happen, so let's make it big and make, it, make, make a big boom mm -hmm. in this story rather than, you know, keeping it contained. So, like, how do you, um, as a big writer yourself, how do you sometimes keep your, your ideas, your creativeness contained or being able to spread them out across 400 pages rather than saying, well, I have all these ideas, let's make them all happen at once? Yeah. You know, that's a big problem. Many writers, if you're studying writing in college, you know, you tend to write small stories. Uh, the professors, uh, there's, there, there's a, a, a father of the, of the modern uh, novel was a, a powerful editor for uh, Atlantic Monthly back in the 1800s. And he said, you know, I'm, I'm really tired of seeing novels where, uh, uh, you know, we have women who've been living for a thousand years and, uh, you know, people lost in ancient civilizations. And uh, we have, you know, uh, travelers who come from other worlds and, you know, blah, 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 blah. And he says, I really want to just have stories that are about common everyday people. And so in the literary mainstream, you know, you're trained to write little stories about people who are living down the block rather than uh, writing big stories like you're talking about. And both of them have their own traps. If you write little stories, you might find yourself writing brilliantly about nothing at all. Um, you know, people who are unimportant doing things that really aren't, don't matter, you know, I mean, the biggest thing that happens in the story is the woman finally figures out how to save her begonias. Um, and then in, if you try to write big, you fall into that trap of writing about too much at once, you know, the end of the world, the beginning of another, the, uh, you know, the, the end of mankind, a man finding his own true love and becoming Adam and Eve on a new world and, you know, all this kind of stuff. And that goes just too far over the top so that people can't relate to the story. So what you have to do is you have to try to meet the two in the middle. You have to write about people um, and conflicts and stuff that are real enough, that have enough emotional power so that people can feel them, but also have enough going on that it feels important, you know, that it is a story. It does create that sense of wonder and, you know, wow, what if this happened? That wouldn't this be cool? Um, and so I keep having to sort of ground myself in my characters over and over again and saying, okay, how do they feel about this? You know, uh, their spaceship crashes. Let's give us the details. Let's make the spaceship crash. And, uh, and then, well, let's give us a background about each character so that uh, we know how they feel about what's going on. You know, we, we bring their, their fear, their terror to life. Is, is the oxygen supply going to keep on going? Or am I stuck on a new planet? And uh, what's it like out there? You know, I hear animals and I see plants and uh, they're nothing like anything on my world. You know, what's, you know, I, I need to get down into the real soul and the heart of the character. And that usually requires me to sit down and um, and begin thinking about it from the point of view of, you know, what are their thoughts? Get into a really close viewpoint 
and start examining, you know, what are they thinking? What are they saying? What are they doing? And, uh, and keep it at that level. Okay, so I have one more question in the general writing area, and then we got some fairly specific ones from some very rabid fans of yours. Okay. So we'll go with the, the last one in a general one. Um, this was uh, for your, your sci-fi writer self. Mm -hmm. It says, how do you make a planet detailed without going into the root of hard science fiction? Where is the limit in detailing the planet and its occupants without derailing the writing process with scientific terms, technical lingo, and the so forth? Yes, uh, we call those indigestible lumps of exposition, or ILEs. Um, uh, what you have to do is uh, there's there's different levels of hardness to your science fiction. You know, Isaac Asimov wrote a series of books on how to create a world for for science fiction, and he suggested that you start with okay. Uh, what, how big is your sun? You know, is it a type G star, type H star, um, type M star? How far away is your planet from that sun? You know, uh, how big is the planet? How many uh, moons does it have circling the planet? And what is the composition of the planet? Uh, is it primarily a carbonaceous uh, planet or is it more massive? Does it have more iron at its core? And uh, how fast does it spin? What angle does uh, is the rotation of its axis to its uh, primary uh, sun? You know, and you get into all of these questions. And when you do it his way, you come up with a very hard science fiction story. You know, you may come up with a planet, for example, that um, has. Uh, uh, a very heavy iron core, 1.38 uh, gravities of, of pressure on it so that your astronaut or a visitor to the planet uh, feels much heavier than they do on Earth. Um, and on this planet, you may have it so that the uh, uh, angle of the, of the uh, sun is fairly constant so that the equator is always extremely hot, creating a desert zone across the across its five continents. Um, and uh, the only place that you can survive is at the poles, which uh, if you you know go down to uh, something like 21 degrees from uh, <laughs> uh, uh, from the pole, you know you've got a, a, a livable zone up there, and uh, you can pick your temperature. You know, balmy 72 degrees uh, every day. You know, you can do it that way, and um, and then what you do is you just ignore the fact that you've done it that way. Okay, um, you know, a planet needs to have, for example, at least one moon in order for it to pull enough gases from the rocks in the soil so that it creates an atmosphere. Uh, but it has to be massive enough so that, that atmosphere doesn't escape into space. And so, you know, you could go through and figure all of that out, or you could just say, I want an Earth-like planet and, um, and use that as your starting place. Uh, I, I kind of like Isaac Asimov's method for, des for describing a science fiction planet because it forces you to get out of your comfort zone and start thinking about the way that planets might be out in space rather than uh, the way that our world is, you know. Uh, if you start looking within our own solar system, you know, we've got half a dozen planets that uh, we can look at. We might say, okay, well, we can't really live, you know, on Jupiter, but we could live on Europa, you know, a moon to one of the gas giants. And you can start describing what life on, on that moon might be like. But, um, you know, overall, uh, I have a feeling that there's just an awful lot more diversity out there than what we see in our own solar system. And uh, so it's kind of fun to play with some of those variables. But, but the real point is that you don't want to go in and give all of that information um, right up front, you know, in a big undigestible lump. You want to make sure that all you do is you give enough information to transport your reader to that world. Uh, and you would do that through the details of, you know, uh, gosh, you know, he's walking and he feels like he gained 70 pounds overnight, you know, uh, that lets us know that he's at a higher gravity than he is on Earth. Uh, 
and uh, you can talk about the smells, and you can talk about uh, you know how wet the atmosphere is, and you know uh, whether there's rainstorms you know washing over it continually, or you know you can give us the details that would be in there without getting into all the description of how the world formed. Well, we'd like to take a moment, listeners, because as always, we'd like to remind you that Audible is offering a free audiobook download with a free 30-day trial to give you the opportunity to check out the service. And basically this week, for this episode, I'd like to recommend a book that I've read a couple of times now. It's been around for a little bit, but if you're a fan of Star Trek, you should check it out. It's called Star Trek Movie Memories, written by William Shatner. And I know what you're thinking, "Uh uh-oh, it's the Shatner. And yet, he goes a little crazy, but there's a lot of cool stories from behind the scenes throughout making the original series movies, uh, Star Trek 1 through 6, and a little bit on uh, Generations. And, uh, you know, basically just, you know, how it came to be, you know, with Leonard Nimoy coming back into the fold, you know, with the whole killing of Spock, bringing Spock back, and how, you know, they came to, you know, each one of them came to direct certain movies, and then just, you know, kind of a story, sort of... Yeah, it's just sort of a roll through of, you know, his experiences through, you know, making the movies. But again, if you're a Star Trek fan, really cool read. Definitely, uh, you know, good to listen to, too. So, you know, head over. Go over to audibletrial.com backslash bombadradio and uh, go check it out. Again, that's Star Trek Movie Memories by William Shatner. Good read. If you're a Trek fan, check it out. And, you know, even if you're just a casual fan, really good book, a lot of good stories. So the next batch of questions, there's three people who are probably qualified to answer these questions. You're one of them. Katie Lucas is another, and George Lucas is another. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of uh, writers back on our forums who really, 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 really like the Night Sisters. Oh, here we go. (laughs) And they've been handing me a lot. And so they sent me a batch of questions. I told them to limit it to a few. Okay. They sent me like six. Okay. And um, so these are ones that... If anyone can answer them, they'd be you, or at least you'd be able to at least guide them in the right direction. Okay. So yes, Santeria, this is for you. Um, so I guess the first one I'm going to ask is, uh, what are ways to write Night Sisters on a behavioral level to show their difference from Sith? Like, how do we make it so they're different than than a Sith, since we know they're dark, we know they're evil, and can use the Force, but they aren't Sith, which is pretty much every other evil Force user in the galaxy. Yeah, exactly. Well, for one thing, um, you know, the Night Sisters, um, when I created them, I wanted to have powerful female characters in the Star Wars universe. Mm -hmm. And so that was really my goal. And I looked at them as being a um, a matriarchal society. Okay. Uh, In other words, uh, they use their powers in order to uh, to enslave the men in their society. And even though they're evil, you know, the Sith are pretty much, um, you know, there can only be one of us, you know, (laughs) kind of a a thing. You know, they they really limit uh, their power um, to, uh, you know, you want to be the top Sith uh, is is what I've got. And with the Night Sisters, I really kind of think of them as being more of a matriarchal society. And so it's not that I am just all out for me, uh, but it's more, um, uh, I am all out for, you know, me and the sisterhood, you know, uh, that, that's kind of the way that I think of, of the Sith. Uh, at the time that I wrote it, I didn't want to get into what all of the powers are that the Sith have, um, and versus what powers, for example, might the Night Sisters have developed that might be a little bit different. And in my mind, I wanted to imagine, uh, I, I wanted to develop um, perhaps some some magic that was specific to the Night Sisters, you know, some certain spells, for example. I uh, didn't really feel like I had that freedom to do that at the time. And uh, probably if I were going to deal with it more, if I were going to write more novels, um, I would probably question Lucasfilm and say, okay, I've got some ideas for night sister specific spells that i would love to play with you know can i use uh, these 10 spells and i would probably develop some night sister spells um, for them a certain magic but i left their society really loose you know um i i imagined that the night sisters were formed up into various clans 
and uh, and I don't remember if I ever even named the number of the clans, but you know maybe there are twenty or forty different clans of Night Sisters um, who were organized, uh, and not all of the Night Sisters were equally evil. Okay, uh, in the sense that uh, um, you know they're they're not all uh, as power hungry. They aren't all as uh, uh, violent. They don't. Uh, not all of them engage in slavery to the, you know quite the same degree. Um, and uh, and the one thing that they do have in their world is that you know uh, um, they look at people who don't have force powers as being um, as being a servant class. You know, uh, they're there to be used the way you'd use cattle or something like that. Um, and so they they objectify people is what they do, okay? And I would probably um, deal with them at that level. I, I might have one little follow up to that one then. So, what role would a a man in their society have? Like a, a high like a high level man? Like what what would be the highest a man could achieve in that type of society then? You know, it's it's interesting because if you look back at at um, you know for example. Uh, Back during Roman t times, there there were people who started out as slaves, who were uh, became entrusted as guards and moved up from being guards uh, to being generals in armies, and so you could be a slave and a general at the same time, okay? But you couldn't be a king, <laughs> and I I kind of imagine that you know within some societies. You would have night sisters who would treat men uh, almost as equals. You know, um, in other words, you could be my bodyguard, you could be my slave, you could be my servant, um, and I might see you as all of those things at once. I might even have you as somebody that I love and I want to keep around for my entire life. What you would never be is, you know, her equal, and uh, and I think that that would be. In a decent society, I think that there are going to be, but I know for sure, you know, when I was writing about them, that uh, in many of these societies, men were there to be used. They were nothing more than slave class, and uh, and in many of those societies, you know, depending upon the uh, depending upon the tribe, you know, or the uh, uh, the group of night sisters, they might say, you know, a man in our society can never be a guard. You know, you could never trust one that much, um, and so they would there there would never be trustees. You know, in certain in certain clans, and I think that that's probably the way that I would run it. I, I look at it and say, that's going to be one of the huge variables, is how do they look at men and other women uh, who have, how do they look at men who have force powers? What do you do with them? Um, if you're in a matriarchal society and you've got a very powerful male. Who's a force power user? You've either got to clip his wings or get rid of him, you know. And maybe, as soon as they start to show signs of having the force, you might have the Night Sisters going out and hunting that uh, young man down, you know. Um, in another society where they're more tolerant, you know, they might say, "Oh, cool, you know, uh, this one would be a good breeder," and uh, so let's figure out how to use him. And so it, it invites some interesting conflicts to think about, okay, how much are they going to trust them? What do you do with a male force user? What do you do with a female who's not a force user? I would say that uh, a male non-force user would probably be a the lowest of the slaves. A female non-force user might be a trustees who would be watch, slaves watching over other slaves. And then you have uh, male force users that could be anything from dead to uh, you know to the servants, and then of course you're going to have the night sisters are going to be the females who are force users and uh, you know who also abide by the rules of the clan. So would a male in this society ever outrank any female, or would they outrank some females, but for the most part be always below the rest, be below the night sisters themselves? I think it depends upon the clan. I think that you could easily have a clan of night sisters. Where you would have a male who was a force user who outranked uh, all females who are non-force users, 
um, who might be, for example, a, uh, a valued concubine, uh, maybe even married to the queen or something like that. He could be a very valuable person in their society, if only as a breeder, you know? And so maybe, uh, maybe he'd be a force user who's untrained. They never train him, you know, uh, because you don't want him to, to become that powerful. Uh, or maybe they're mistrained <laughs> so that you effectively clip their wings. Um, but it, it's, that's kind of the fun that I wanted to have with the various societies was to, to have, to look at the Night Sisters and say, okay, um, what is, what is this clan going to do? Okay. Um, and, and then we develop the rules for the society for each clan, but make them different. I think that would be a fun thing to do. Oh, we have a friend of ours, uh, goes by the name of Christian. I'm going to start calling him valued concubine from now on. <laughs> um, <laughs> That was great. Good info, though. Very good info. But, um, you know, staying on the Night Sisters, but moving a little bit off of that topic, uh, another question that we had was when writing the physical description of a Night Sister, what would be considered important in terms of setting them apart from how, I guess you could say, the modern day would view the whole quote unquote witch appearance? Oh, yeah, I think that's really important. You know, every every society has its own dress and grooming standards, okay? And uh, there's a great picture I saw on Facebook the other day of a woman in Africa. Her hair appears to be dyed blood red and, uh, and it is brushed out over her face so that it completely obliterates her face, you know? And she looks non-human, almost looks alien, you know? Uh, and I can't remember what color of robes she wore. But, you know, various societies all have different ways of tagging each other. For example, you know, in, um, among the ancient, um, among the ancient uh, Mayans, um, the lowest castes were not allowed to wear clothes, okay? Um, and so if you were a slave, you were not allowed to wear any clothes at all. If you were a free person, you were allowed to wear some clothes. Um, and that might include, for example, a jock strap. You know? uh, that might be the lowest of the low. If you grew wealthier, you were allowed to wear things like shirts and coats. Um, and if you were the wealthiest, you got to have, uh, well, and that, then of course you had uh, decorations. You could start putting a cotton earring in your ear. And if you uh, were wealthier, you could dye that cotton. And if you were wealthier than that, you could put gold with the cotton. And, uh, and so they had a very distinct caste system and you could tell someone by their dress, that's the point. And with the Night Sisters, I think I mentioned in there, um, at least in my initial past, that the, 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 the male slaves were naked. Um, they were so poor that they were not allowed clothes, um, which, you know, quite frankly goes to serve the wealthy uh, who not only want to dehumanize them, but also uh, makes them suffer and it lets you see how pleasing they are to look at, you know, <laughs> based upon their physical appearances. There's, there's nothing hiding. Um, and so uh, the, the big point though, is that I think that each of the clans of Night Sisters would have their own dress, their own attire and their own values of what is beautiful and, uh, and what is not. And so for example, in a hill society where um, silver is there but not abundant you know maybe they have silver jewelry and maybe uh because they want to blend into the trees you know, they dress in greens and browns you know primarily and maybe because they like to do that they even go so far as to um uh tattoo their faces you know so that uh so that they have greens and browns on their faces um, and in another society, uh, they might have a completely different attire, you know, maybe different shades of black um, signify rank, uh, which is, I think, what I ended up doing with some of the Night Sisters. And uh, I, it's very subtle, but, uh, it, but you know, it's there. Um, in any case, the idea being that I think that uh, your clothing has to be appropriate to the climate. It has to be appropriate to the materials they have at hand. It uh, probably is going to be used to signify your wealth. 
but it might also be uh, there to satisfy your vanity. So for example, you might have a group of night sisters in the desert um, who uh, all dress in silks, you know, and they're all very flashy and, uh, you know, every woman looks absolutely gorgeous. You know, every, everyone is more stunning than the last. And it may be that uh, your own personal artistic sense then becomes what sets you apart from others, you know, so they value creativity. And so I would, uh, that's one of the reasons why I wanted to play with different clans of night sisters. And uh, unfortunately the novel just, you know, wasn't big enough to, to explore that, the, the possible worlds that you could create, the societies that you could create. Um, but uh, yeah, yeah, if I were to go back and do some more with it, that's what I would do. Oh, that's, that, that works well, actually. You know, I, I always, I kind of had an inkling of that. I mean, Jeremiah, I know that, you know, being on the forum that we're at and, you know, reading all the different writing, we probably got an idea that that's kind of how it should go. But, you know, here you go, ladies and gentlemen, from the horse's mouth. Yeah. <laughs> there you I, go. <laughs> you know, we have another question uh, from, you know, the members of the forum. And uh, this, their question is this. There have been comparisons between Wicca and Night Sisters. How much of the Wiccan influence should be incorporated, if any, into writing a Night Sister? I did not intentionally uh, try to put any Wicca influence into the Night Sisters whatsoever. Uh, that was, you know, uh, I, I called them witches, the witches of Dathomir and things like that, and I called them the Night Sisters. Um, I just wanted to have a, a matriarchal society. I wasn't really trying to replicate Wicca at all. Okay, because well, that's definitely been a question that's been on for a while because a lot of people think they do, and, well, that, that answers that question. Yeah, really, that's just short, simple, sweet, and to the point. Now you know. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Okay, so we have three more questions on, on Night Sisters. Some of them are quick and easy like that one. So the next one would be, when writing weaknesses for Night Sisters, what is a way to avoid over usage of already trending weaknesses seen within the Star Wars universe? Okay. Well, there's different kinds of weaknesses. You know, there's the, the weakness of power, for example. How powerful is she? You know, um, I like to play when I'm gaming, for example, with characters who have, how should I say it? You know, in, instead of being the most powerful sorcerer ever, I like to play with sorcerers who, uh, uh, if I were doing a role-playing game, who um, really aren't very powerful. You know, they know three spells, but they figured out how to use them really well. You know? Like magic missile. <laughs> it's like magic missile. Lightning yes, bolt. Exactly. <laughs> I'll cast it on the darkness. <laughs> and, and, and the reason why is because it limits you. It, it, it says, okay, you can use magic to solve this problem, or you can use your wits, you know, or your legs to run away. Or, you know, do I fly? Do I, you know, do I fight? Do I fly? Do I, you know, uh, use the warrior as a human shield? What am I going to do in this situation? And so there's that limitation that you have with your night sister. I would, I would invite people to really have fun with it and say, you know, I'm not going to try to make her the most all powerful night sister ever. Okay. I don't want her to be Darth Vader's wife. You know, she's not trying to take him as a slave and uh, make him her to make him her toy. Um, so that's the one thing that I want to do with my night sisters. The other thing that I would look at is there's, there's all sorts of weaknesses. Okay. For example, the first weakness that comes to mind is compassion. Okay, now for a night sister to be overly compassionate, to be overly sensitive to, you know, what slaves think uh, or what men think or want or anything, uh, that can be a, a great weakness, you know. So sometimes your weakness is your humanity itself, I guess. Um, but then, of course, there's other weaknesses that you could induce, you know. Uh, are there powerful force users who aren't too bright, for example? Um, you know, so I would I would just invite myself to look at, you know, the various type of weaknesses. Are there force users, for example, of low status? You know, you can have a you can have a person who's a powerful force user who just happens to come from a clan of, you know, people who are recognized as, you know, they're just not upper tier, uh, you know, as far as the Night Sisters go. 
And so that might be a, a weakness. So there's there's social weaknesses, there's uh, emotional weaknesses, there are physical limitations and things like that. And you can play with all of those. Excellent. That, 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 that's actually useful for everyone when it comes to writing uh, all sorts of characters. So I believe James has another question and then I have one more about Night Sisters. Yes. And then we'll begin wrapping up. Okay. You have yet another one of the questions. <laughs> All right, and the next question we have from those on the forum. What is a way to write in Night Sister in a dominant female role with the removal of the warrior archetype? Okay. Um, that is a really great question, okay? Because we have two archetypes that we play with, and, and one of them is the male-centric warrior archetype, which in a matriarchal society may not be the, the archetype you want to play with. The female archetype is the archetypal healer, the, uh, the nurturer, the, the mother goddess kind of a figure. And, uh, and usually stories that involve um, the female archetype are what we call round stories. They're round in shape. They begin where... I should say they end where they began. So, you know, for example, um, a story might begin with a young girl whose mother uh, is killed in a battle, okay? And she's six years old. She's sitting there. She knows that her mother and father are dead. Uh, most of her people are dead. And, uh, and she wonders, you know, she's going to just sit there on her mother's grave once she gets it finished digging it. And, uh, and then she's going to starve to death and die. And as she's thinking about that, um, an older woman comes along, and it's the, uh, it's the lady who's the healer for their tribe, okay? Um, and she says, you know, come with me. And she takes her in as her apprentice. And she becomes an apprentice healer, and she falls in love with a young man, just as her mother did, and uh, she marries him, and they're attacked by their enemies just as they had been years ago. And uh, the father goes off to war and, uh, and is killed. And she goes with him into battle and tries to save him and manages to save other people and drags herself back home and discovers that she has a baby. And, uh, and you know, in other words, she completes the cycle. And, uh, and she's an old lady by herself. And as she's looking at the remains of the battle, she sees a young girl sitting there weeping over her own dead mother. And she goes to her and says, you know, come with me. Okay, that's the, that's the round story. That's the female hero journey. And, um, and that might be one hint at a way to look at this and say, what is a story about an archetypal nurture? And, you know, even in a s society of night sisters, that person would be very powerful. In fact, I would think that among many clans, she would be the most powerful person. You know, she would be the leader of the clan. Fantastic. So we have one more question about night sisters, and then we have that's a couple of wrap up questions. Okay. So, last question about night sisters. Um, what would you say is a valuable resource to refer to when writing a night sister? Oh my! God. Other than this interview, of course. Other than this interview, I really don't know. You know, I haven't I haven't looked online to see uh, really what other people have done with them. You know, or how they've evolved or changed. So I don't know an awful lot about about what's out there as far as materials. I mean, I I kind of came up with the concept and. And uh, when you add something to the Star Wars universe, you know, it becomes Lucasfilm's property. And uh, if they want to incorporate it into gaming systems and, uh, you know, characters that are in cartoon series, uh, you know, they're free to do whatever they like with it. And um, my big problem is I haven't really been following real closely what all of this has turned into. You know, I know that... Um, there have been some video games, uh, you know, with Dathomir in it, and I think it's been referenced in some of the cartoon series and things like that, but I, I just don't know the extent of all of it. So I wish I could answer that question better. <laughs> so I guess the, the, the answer would be this interview is a good place to go for. This is a good, for this is a good place to go for. Um, I don't know. Are Night Sisters, you know, in the Star Wars gaming system now and, you know, like the role-playing games? I would think that that would be probably a good resource 
if uh, if they've been incorporated into the role playing games at all. Um, but I don't know. I don't know. Um, I know they were used in Clone Wars quite a bit. Um, they had a, a, a decent, the detailed arc there, but for the most part, the details you gave here is far more than anything we get from other sources. So yeah. thank you for that. Okay. Just, uh, the last question we're going to ask before just checking on what you're up to would be, um, it has to do with writer's block and writing routine. So I'm just going to combine these two questions into one. Uh, first of all, do you have a daily routine to keep you writing and not stymied by all the distractions that are currently in the information age? And then how do you get through a writer's block um, do you power through it, force yourself through, or wait for it to subside? Well, uh, writer's block, first of all, comes when, to me, when I don't know, when I haven't done enough pre-writing, I haven't thought about what I want to write enough. And so um, so what I have to do is I have to sit down and say, okay, what's my next scene going to be? And who's going to be the star of the scene? And where is the scene going to be set? And what conflict is that character dealing with? As soon as I've got those three things, who, what, and where, I have enough information that I can start thinking about different ways that I can handle it, okay? And so that's what I do. And, uh, and I, I just basically have to, to sit down and focus on a scene to write, okay? So uh, that's how I power through it. Um, it. It's by taking the time to think about that particular scene. Unfortunately, too many people get into it and they're Thoughts are flipping from one scene to the next. They don't know what to do next. You know, they're worried about their taxes or something like that. So they're distracted by other things. And and you just have to kind of let go of those distractions. Um, I have a saying that I used in one of my recent daily kicks, you know, which which says, you know, um, you know, inspiration is what you use to to get you going, you know, when you go to the gym, but habit is what keeps you going. And so if you as a writer, you know, feel inspired to write something, what you need to do is to start making, use that inspiration to make it into a habit. Say, okay, I really feel inspired. I'm gonna get up and work on this tomorrow at, uh, at 6 a.m. and write for two hours. And I'm going to do that every day for the next week. At the end of that week, your writing will have become something of a habit. And so what you do is you just keep on saying, okay, I'm gonna keep doing that you know, every day. And in my writing workshops, I teach these week-long writing workshops primarily for that reason, so that I can get my writers to come and get into the habit of writing. And I get letters from people saying, wow, Dave, I took your writing workshop, you know, back in April last year, and uh, I, I just wanted to thank you. I've just finished my fourth novel that I've written in this last year and a half, or you know, and, uh, and I get those letters quite frequently, you know, and so I feel like I've done my job when I do that. So, um, yeah, when you get writer's block, uh, just sit down and focus on one scene at a time and, you know, give yourself a little time to pre-write. For me, oddly, really, laying down in bed is the biggest help that I can get because I can't do anything else. If I start answering my emails or something like that, it's just a distraction, you know? But if I just lay in bed and think about that scene and visualize it, it'll come to me. Awesome. So I, I guess the last thing we're gonna ask is, uh, if people wanna ask you more questions, wanna see what, wanna, you'll see you in person, uh, what's your current projects? What are you currently up to? And uh, how, where can people see you and contact you? Well, I'm gonna be going to Life, the Universe and Everything, um, which is up in Provo, Utah, uh, this next week. So I'm gonna be there Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. I'm going to be teaching a lot of writing workshops over the next couple of months. You can find those at uh, uh, davidfarland.com. Um, I'll be teaching some short story writing workshops, and I'm going to be teaching a uh, million dollar outlines class, and I'll be teaching a novel rewriting class. Uh, and I've got about half a dozen lined up for the coming year, but I'm also going to be going to uh, Jordan Con, and I'm going to be going to Gen Con this year. And uh, I'm not sure what other things. I'm also looking at Oricon. And, uh, and there's probably going to be one more, but I don't know what it is yet. So those, those are the things I'm working on as far as places I go. Other than that, I'm finishing up the last Rune Lords novel uh, right now and uh, working on trying to get a movie made and uh, just getting ready to write my next book in the uh, Nightingale series. Excellent. I look forward to reading that, the last Rune Lords novel. I've been following that series for 
for quite a while. Yep. So, uh, and uh, it should be quite good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No pressure. So. No pressure at all. <laughs> yep. I, I, that's what part of the reason I've taken so long to write it. I want it to be good. Okay. Well, thank you for being on. Thank you for answering our questions. Um, I know we kind of sprung this on you, and uh, you have been most helpful. And I'm quite sure our, our well, the writers at our forums and so on, and anyone who listens to this are going to be extremely grateful for your words. Thank you for that. Well, thank you. And uh, yes. we look forward to having you on the show again in the future. I'm thank telling you. you. He, he's turned Jeremiah. He has basically turned into the unofficial Bombad Radio writing correspondent. Yeah. There you go. Okay. I'll, I'll be happy to do that. I'll be happy to talk to you anytime you guys like, okay? Thank you very much, and uh, we'll let you get back to your family and get back to writing and uh, go back to your weekend. Absolutely. Okay. okay, sounds great. We'll talk to you later. Have a good day, sir. Okay, bye-bye. Have a good one.